Hello, everyone. This is Oran. I am an educator of philosophy based in Austin. And this is the continuation of our discussion um, uh, under the Ferzuka project, our grand project. And I'm here today with my great friend, Tren. Hello, Tren. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is your friend, Tren. I'm a cultural historian of early medieval Europe and the late medieval China. And it's great pleasure to be with you today around to continue our physical journey. That's um, perfect. So uh, just to put things in context, of course, uh, some of you may have just been uh, listening to this episode independent from anything that else we have done um, in this channel so far. Just a very quick um, um, just summary of what the, what the idea behind these uh, videos are and what exactly you are um, encountering here. And then we can move on. We can talk about uh, what we're going to talk about today. So the, the general point about the Ferzuha project um, is that what we are concerned about is um, we have we have questions that traditionally uh, are understood as uh, questions belonging to humanities and philosophy and uh, social sciences. But um, these conversations came from originally from our frustration of how these questions are uh, dealt with in academia and in more scholarly uh, circles. And the general problem with those areas and we have talked about this in our manifesto, uh, is uh, hyper-specialization and a lack of connection between different parts and lack of any ambition to put, to have a comprehensive view um, uh, of um, uh, basic questions um, upon us in humanities and philosophy. And, and that's, that's the basic idea behind what we are doing here. Now, in pursuing these questions and interests, uh, we deal with different texts and we don't have a predetermined like set of readings uh, rather we uh, proceed dialectically meaning that we have an interest we think this book or that thinker um, are relevant to that thought we get involved we wrestle with that thinker then we see what happens in which direction um, that uh, wrestling takes us uh, so that's how it's done and, and you're going to see in the future that that's what we uh, we suspect uh, is going to happen. That this is going to become uh, very much interdisciplinary in uh, disciplines that do not really seem to have given the proper voice in questions of humanities and philosophy. Also, uh, will get involved. So far, though, a lot of our conversations have been at the border of uh, uh, intellectual history. And, and the questions of enlightenment and counter enlightenment and, and how philosophy and social sciences kind of interact. And in that specific uh, part of our um, uh, Ferzuka project, we dealt with uh, Gillian Rose's uh, book, Hegel Contra Sociology. And she used Hegel as someone who can potentially challenge the very basic assumptions of social sciences and humanities of our time. And that drew us to Hegel himself and his project. And we spent many, many episodes on Hegel's Science of Logic, the beginning of Hegel's uh, Science of Logic that you can, you can find in our channels and uh, in the proper um, the playlist. Now, what you're gonna hear in the, uh, in the next couple of episodes is gonna still be on Hegel on a different text. And uh, briefly, we, we, we want to um, kind of explain how we got here, where we want to take this. The, the text that we are going to deal with is um, inter Introduction to uh, uh, um, World History, uh, the lectures that Hegel um, um, gave at different points in his life, and there are different uh, drafts of that, uh, those lectures. Uh, but the, the part that we're going to focus on, that, and it is a part that has been discussed more than any other part of that, uh, the lecture series is the introduction, which is called uh, Reason in History. And the idea here in Reason in History, and it gets connected to um, some of our uh, important um, interests. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues is that like, I, I, I mainly uh, focus on philosophy, trend mainly focuses on in, in, in history. And this, there is that point of the story, but also we are, we are very much interested in this 
an interaction between uh, cultural history and maybe as a continuation of that even uh, evolutionary process at the biological level um, and uh, philosophical questions that might be uh, related to questions of, for instance, human nature. Um, and what happens in reason and history is that uh, a lot of these points of interest are discussed by Hegel. And by, by nature, because these are introductory lectures, uh, Hegel talks about a lot of aspects of his system uh, that uh, he doesn't get into the details there, uh, but they are present. Um, but he's going to cover the points about the relation between history and philosophy, and the relation between religion and the state, the relation between um, national spirit and the historical spirit of the world in general, and all of these uh, points that he's going to talk about, touch upon uh, in reason and history are uh, very important for us. Um, one thing before entering this conversation um, and talking about reason and history uh, with Trent is to remember that uh, our purpose here, we're not interpreters of Hegel. We're not interested in becoming Hegel scholars, uh, and that's not about Hegel. We're not interested in becoming anyone's scholar. Uh, that's not to deny the value of the scholarship. It just means that we are not that. And I think that's a very important difference uh, because the way that we're going to deal with this, the way that we are going to wrestle with this, uh, of course, we're going to take Hegel seriously. Of course, we're going to take um, his ideas as best as we could in terms of the, in the context of what he's talking about. Uh, what we ultimately care, though, is that how where does Hegel inspire us to go? Like, what ideas uh, Hegel pushes us to think about? What kind of puzzles he introduced? What puzzles he uh, resolves? And in in, in that like with that uh, emphasis, there is a sacrifice, and that sacrifice is we might not be absolutely accurate about our interpretation of Hegel. That's secondary to us. If Hegel inspires us to think about the right thing or think better about a topic that we're interested about, that's enough for us. Uh, and that is the essence of this. So in, in our conversations between the two of us and also as a matter of extension to all of you listeners, um, the emphasis is going to be uh, the inspiration and the, the intellectual originality that might be useful for uh, answers to uh, basic questions of humanities and not just uh, uh, scholarships in 19th century German philosophy. So with that, um, we can uh, we can begin on, on conversation. Trent, do you have anything to add at, at this point? No, um, I'm just very excited. The, the, the one big reason that this specific text was very attractive to me is not because I want to see whether Hegel got like what the history right, given his like evidence or sources, but rather how he applied what he how he practiced what he preached in his science of logic all those sort of um brilliant ideas surrounding the the lack of nature of being or identity and how did he apply such understanding of very nuanced and quite frankly speaking quite radical in his time understanding of such term into his analysis of like cultural identities and um nation states and the relationship between individual and collective like universal human nature that sort of thing uh and i think we have a lot to talk about what hegel himself um could offer basically to thinkers of our kind that we draw materials and inspirations for our own discipline but we would love to um go broad outside of the disciplinary confines to see whether there are better ways to connect say history and philosophy i think he this text has much to offer. So we're excited. Yes. Uh, one last thing that I add as the preliminary uh, point is that another interest that we had uh, with Trent while uh, like getting into this book and getting to, into Hegel uh, to an extent as well uh, was this idea of like whether, whether Hegel has anything to offer for comparative studies. 
and that could be comparative um, cultural studies, could be co co uh, comparative history, and um, a trend working directly in that area. He has seen uh, some um, theoretical flaws in how people uh, approach this. And uh, th that's uh, just a reminder to the listeners that if that theme at some point pops up, uh, that's also because we are, we are very much interested um, in that, not just as a matter of, matter of uh, theoretical concern, but because I'm from originally from Iran, Trent is uh, originally from China. We are um, like living in um, the US and we are like uh, in contact with like intellectual traditions from you know, Germany or France or places of like that. So this is also the point about comparative history and comparative cultural studies. It's not just, just a detached uh, and, you know, a random uh, intellectual desire that we have. It's very much related to uh, to how uh, our, our condition is. Yeah, just our lives is uh, intertwined with that. Okay, so given all of these points, uh, the way that we're going to begin this conversation is not going to be chronological based on what Hegel talks about. It's more like an intellectual reorganization of the argument that he has. And uh, with, with the a bigger emphasis on uh, the stuff that are uh, interesting to us. And one of the main things that is interesting to us um, is the concept of human nature, right? And Hegel's understanding of history, Hegel's understanding of the relationship between history and philosophy to us um, is, uh, very much dependent on his understanding of human nature. Now, Hegel doesn't start reasoning history by just saying that here is my, here's the deal with human nature, let's move on. Uh, neither he, he does uh, 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 that in any other work, but like in, in none of those works, he starts with an idea of what a human nature is. But as we're gonna see as the, this conversation also develops, everything Hegel says about history, everything Hegel says about the relationship between philosophy and history is contingent upon a very specific understanding of human nature. Uh, not just what is the definition of human nature, but what else, what, what, what kind of a thing it is. Like wh when we're thinking about human nature, oh, is this like an empirical inquiry into human nature or human nature is about like, how could we even arrive at the question of uh, human nature or right? the answer to the question of human nature, right? And of course, uh, Hegel, in many ways, uh, many places, uh, talks about uh, human nature. And we talked about that uh, um, in a specific quote uh, from opening of Hegel's logic in, in our episode on that uh, uh, series um, about uh, of, of, um, determination. And Hegel definitely, in, in the logic, also speaks of the determination of man. What is it to be a man that has an answer? Right, so Hegel definitely is not saying that, okay, we don't know, but there is no human nature. He has an idea, right? And, and in lectures on the uh, philosophy of world history, and we've used Nisbet's translation for that, um, there are a couple of points that he directly starts talking about um, human nature. And in this episode, we're gonna just try to try our best to tell you what Hegel is communicating in so far as it is interesting to us. And there is going to be an episode later on that we're going to um, have the, a critical assessment of uh, what Hegel uh, what Hegel talks about. And the first long quote uh, that we have uh, from um, Reason in History, the introduction, um, Hegel, Hegel's idea of the uh, human nature here is, um, it has both it's it's interesting because it has two parts. So he, he writes, the expression of human nature is usually taken to represent something fixed and, and constant. Descriptions of human nature are meant to apply to all men, past and present, right? So there is there is that point, this acknowledgement of uh, something that is applicable to every human um, uh, being must possess. Um, and he continues that the general pattern is capable of infinite modifications, but however much it may vary, it nevertheless remains essentially the same, right? So there is, there are, we're getting clues of uh, what we are thinking when we think human nature with Hegel. Uh, we are thinking about something present in humanity. There are variations, but something remains essentially there. Some, something remains essentially the same. He continues, 
Reflective thought must disregard the differences and isolate the common factor which can be expected to behave in the same way and to show itself in the same light under all circumstances. Right? Um, so for Hegel, there are differences within humanity. There are aspects of us that are just this infinite modification, let's call it. But when it comes to reflection, what matters is that common thing. What matters is that kind of es essence of humanity. Um, and he ends, like the end of this code, he, he writes, it is possible to detect the general type, even in those examples which seem to diverge most widely from it. And we can recognize human nature in the most distorted of forms. So it is, like I think the point that Hegel is mentioning here is that it's, of course, there is diversity. Of course, there is like differences and divergence and all of that. Uh, but even in, in the most kind of uh, unfamiliar versions of it, uh, you see uh, a sign of it. And here, actually, this point about human nature that even with the you know divergence, you see the the basic form uh, in humanity actually is going to be applied to his understanding of history, right? Like for, for Hegel, like some uh, very kind of uh, primitive in Hegel's view, uh, cultures and nations uh, are very far away from really representing uh, human nature to its fullest. And they do a lot of things that are very, di you know, they diverge from that idea of human nature that we are going to um, expound on shortly. But they're still in it. They're just like badly representing it. Like they're just, they're not, they're, they're not fundamentally different. They are just insufficiently articulate about what that human nature is, right? Um, and that is a theme that is gonna, uh, that is gonna um, come back. And Hegel mentions in different places of like what this common, uh, denominator is and in the, the lectures on the philosophy of world history the reason uh, in history part he says that the fundamental characteristic of human nature is that man can think of himself as an ego and this idea of a man can uh, think of himself as an ego uh, basically covers a lot of ground right and the, the, i think the, the idea is that humanity is that the, the common core of humanity is this ability to distance oneself from oneself, right? Not only we can uh, distance ourselves from objects and not be, be fully absorbed in the world, but we can distance ourselves from ourselves. Uh, like the, the, the level of detachment that a human being can experience from themselves uh, is very different from how, you know, a, a, a deer or a cat could do that, right? They, they have some level of self-awareness, they are present, but they don't have this idea that, oh, I am Jeff. Like they don't have this idea that I am like this kind of uh, differentiated thing that I could detach myself. I can put myself in different narratives. I can think about past. I can think about like even like memory in some ways. It just becomes possible only if we can just de detach, right? So the point about ego to me as the, you know, the, the fundamental characteristic of human nature um, is an example or an expression of this idea about distancing. Uh, which is going to get translated into a, a broader term called self-conscious agency, which uh, we are going to we're going to discuss shortly. But before uh, moving on, Trent, um, any thoughts? Yes, um, I, while I was reading this, it, it strikes me as quite interesting that Hegel holds a, has, for like a better term, maybe sort of strat definition approach towards the essence of humankind. That there is something that is out of history, that is timeless, that is, that is unchanging and fixed, that it unifies all human particular examples of human individuals. And by tracing that, you can, that with that, you, there are a lot of um, methodological advantages or if your critiques that there will be an oversimplification one is the um method of comparison that with this common denominator in hand you can safely compare all human social forms because we already have an external 
a neutral parameter for assessment. Like, oh, how does say ancient India um, structure their society, and that how did it relate to this uh, neutral definition, quote unquote, of human nature, comparing with say nineteenth century German or Prussian um, on the standing. So with this so-called tertium comparationis or the third neutral term um, extracted or abstracted, um, one can put two different set of data together and evaluate them, which makes the whole comparison very uh, straightforward and neat, but uh, less convincing for certain other um, comparativists. That's one mm -hmm. thing. The second thing is also perhaps makes it much easier for Hegel to draw the line between human beings and other forms of in animals or like life forms, because this fundamental characteristic of the humankind is unique to human. And therefore the boundary is very clear because you have to like non-overlapping course. What I was wondering is whether the example of human nature was just a expedient means in the Buddhist language or a pedagogical tool that is like an example that even it fails to, that it does not violate Hegel's overall point or is it a sine qua non condition for his whole structure in intellectual enterprise to stand and the more I read um, Hegel's writing the more I think is the second case that if that is the case for those of us who are interested in thinking with Hegel and bringing his like logical system, whatever, outside, we must confront this human nature question and take it very ser seriously. If we disagree with his like a neutral, universal, fixed definition of human nature, if we are not satisfied with that way of doing comparison, then what shall we do? If we, how how do we need? What kind of necessary steps are necessary um, to modify and qualify his the overall relationship between human nature and the logical being to be able to apply what we see what value in his like analysis about the uh, science of logic. So that's what I have to say about this slide. Back to you. Yeah. So yeah, I, and and I think there there is also uh, something that is interesting that uh, hopefully in the next slides and also in our critical remarks. Um, uh, we can touch upon is that so the, the uh, thinking of human nature as an a, a priori question, thinking of that question as to be very broad, uh, broadly a non empirical question, uh, is not limited to Hegel, right? When I say non -imper empirically, is that um, whatever Hegel suggests to us is that it's not that you we're waiting for another human being to come up and then we're going to change our human conception of human nature. Right, it's not the approach that Hegel has uh, to human nature is not about like it's not looking forward to meet a new human being. It's already clear what that human being is going to be, um, and this is not something unique to Hegel. There are, however, some things that are within this unique to Hegel. That uh, when we get to the point about um, like history and um, philosophy. Uh, I will um, I will talk about that um, a, a little bit more. But at this point, we also need to uh, talk to about two other points that I, I think are important that Hegel mentions about um, uh, about the relationship between this empirical element uh, of you know the quote unquote next human being versus the conception, right? And how Hegel wants to deal with that. Um, uh, deal with that tension, and he he addresses that uh, awaits indirectly um, in um, a later parts of the, um, the reason in history. And he says nature is not as strong enough to preserve its general class and species from the influence of other elemental factors and agencies. But although the organization of man, for example, is defined by the concrete form it assumes, and the brain, the heart, etc., are specified as additional ingredients. It is quite possible to do some wretched abortion or freak, which possesses a generally human form and without any of those, you know, without those specific parts. Um, so, uh, like, the, the thing that is interesting to me, and I, I think it's going to come up uh, later in our inquiry over human nature in general, is the idea of uh, deviation, right? So, 
I think Hegel has a view, uh, Hegel's view of human nature is deviation based, meaning that uh, differences that occur that do not fit the main conception of human nature are deviations from human nature. And even the hardest deviations have the distant you know, echo of the core, right? Uh, have some resemblance, have some connection to that core, right? I really emphasize at this point um, on deviation because we need to remember that we can only think about deviation, which Hegel's point here is um, very physical, right? A, a human being without heart or you know seven fingers is a deviation, right? Um, according to um, to Hegel. But it's not only a deviation from a typical human being, it's deviation from human nature or a deviation from the best form of human nature, right? Best shape of human nature, right? What I mean here is uh, that Hegel's conception of human nature already contains an art that there is a version of human nature that is going to be inherently more articulate, just like a human being who has a brain as a heart and five fingers is healthier uh, than, a, than a person who is uh, who doesn't have those, uh, is more attuned to something that what a human should be. Right? So I think what Hegel implies, without even talking about anything else, with this approach is that there is a standard implicit there. And we saw that when we were talking about the logic and the concept of art came up from any, from very, you know, immediate is, there is art that you are like, concept creates expectation, right? And human nature as Hegel understands it um, is uh, definitely creating expectation, creates an art in it. This art is going to be very different from the art of the moral Zolin that uh, Hegel criticized, people like Julian Rose criticized, and we have talked in our past episodes. It's still an art, it's still an art um, and a standard um, in, in that analysis. Um, and yeah, so it's important to have this idea that the human nature is not just, as you were mentioning, like a pedagogical point. I think it's going to inform everything Hegel was going to say about um, the quote unquote end of history or the, the goal of history or um, any discussions of, uh, of that kind. It's going to be very much um, tied up with that. Um, anything about that, Trey? Yes. I really like the point about art and that like the different concept that there is a, also an expectation coming out. When I was reading um on this section, I was thinking it's not just a deviation as you mentioned rightfully, it's also kind of um graded or um kind of a hierarchical deviation that a certain parts uh, if they are not fulfilling the expectations that the, the individual that example still qualifies as a human being say if you have seven finger whatever on one hand uh, important qualification uh, but if you do not have say important um uh, components of a brain so to allow you to think rationally then you're like a disqualified so that's just like because i'm interested in comparative religions that sounds really dominant approach towards so-called world religions like the five pillars approach of islam if you are not rich enough it's all right you can still be a very good muslim without going to mecca for your whole life but if you do not like observe other precepts like observe ramadan where you're perfectly healthy then you're not really a good muslim too so so the, the art thing expectation thing and that kind of bundle cluster to a certain extent that he is willing to deconstruct that abstracted form of a human being but um, there's still like a hierarchy of like properties and certain 
properties are not compromisable. So that those are things I see in this slide. Yes. That's a very good point. I think that's a very good point. Yes, because the idea of deviation could exist probably without that hierarchy, right? Without any, uh, at least any set hierarchy. But there's definitely a hierarchy there. Like Hegel is not so much concerned about, you know, all sorts of deviations that could exist like all sorts of diseases that a person might have or temperament differences. Like th th there are certain things that they are still, um, like there is definitely di aspects in humanity that are part of the common core. And, and even then there are, there is a hierarchy within that in terms of like what is the most important thing about um, humanity. Um, in that sense, the deviation happens in a double manner. The deviation happens because there is a baseline, and in that baseline, there is a hierarchy that you can. There, there is. Devi all deviations are not equal, basically. Uh, some some deviations are more important than others, and all of that just comes from the this basic idea that there is human nature. Human nature has a core, and this core is what matters. Um, and the rest just just uh, follows naturally from that. Now, uh, there are some points in um, Hegel that are focused on comparing human beings with other animals, right? And uh, in in creating this uh, episode, we also consulted uh, Terry Pinkford's uh, doesn't make history make sense. Terry Pinkford is a well well known uh, scholar of Hegel. And some points that we're going to mention here is going to be related um, to his interpretation of Hegel. But it is very interesting that Hegel, the way that Hegel thinks about, like we we ha we have this humanity, we have humanity. There is a recognition of the anim animality of humanity, right? But then there is a question of like, what is the animality of humanity versus animality? of a, you know, line. Like, what is the difference between the two, right? And if we put them in the continuum of animality, like, is there a point of, like, like is there a break? Is there a leap? Or is it just continuity? And I think it's very clear that for Hegel, there is a leap, right? And he, he writes in, in Reason and History, the quote, Men cannot have developed from a state of animal insensibility, although he may well be have developed from a state of human insensibility. Animal humanity is altogether different from animality proper. And I think the point here is that, I mean, like one part of it that we're going to be addressing, the critical part, is like blindness to, to evolution and, and um, the biological component of this. But even if we think about it not in that way, uh, we can think about it in a different way that even is, I think, compatible with evolution. We say, okay, we have de developed um, you know, from the same branch of any other, like, like we are the same, we're part of the same tree, we're part of it. But hey, as soon as we got so and so, right, which for Hegel is self conscious agency, insofar as we got that potential in us, insofar as we were able to have quote unquote egos, or as we talked before about this point, we sort of naming each other and kind of like create that idea that here is who you are and here is a distance you have with yourself and, and, and all of that capacities. As soon as we did that, our animality also changed in a way that our animality is not on par with other animals anymore. Um, and I think a quote that is significant to me uh, for, um, for understanding this point, which we're going to uh, discuss more later on, is Terry Pinkard quoting Matthew Boyle. And he, he writes, in Matthew Boyle's phrase, Hegel's conception of human subjectivity is not an additive, but rather a transformative conception of the role of reason in our lives. That just means that Reason is not something that you just, you know, you, you're a lion and on top of that, you have this other thing that is going on, which goes back to the idea of hierarchy. But I think 
the justification for hierarchy is that this feature is what kind of creates this distance between us and other animals, right? Human agency is human nature. Self-conscious agency, subjectivity in the form that we experience it is human nature because it is the feature that transforms our animality, right? As soon as the animal becomes self-conscious, as soon as an animal has a sense that it is an animal, a new story begins. And the story about like the other side becomes much lower in the hierarchy, right? Just goes further down, right? Yes, we say that we have, we have uh, you know, animal desires and all of that, all of that. But hey, we've, we've got rash, we are reason. What we are is reason. What we are is that capacity to distance. What we are is subject in this way. And then when we, when someone becomes like, you know, um, goes and participates in an orgy and just drinks all the time and all of that, we think of that person as someone who has fallen from their humanity, right? Again, thinking about some, something about uh, the hierarchy of action. And uh, Pinkard also uh, mentions this in a different way that I, that I like, that he says, rational animal, quote unquote, is not a substance with a subject, subject stuck onto it who monitors it. It is a subject which is a substance that knows it is that kind of substance by bringing itself under the category subject. So what this human nature is, is this ability to distance oneself, this ability to reflect, and this ability to um, have a sense of oneself, even at the basic level of knowing that, hey, I'm an animal. And we already know like some other layers of this like consequence of knowing um, uh, that uh, definitely are, are interesting. And one of the important examples is this mortality, right? That how us knowing that we're gonna die changes the game for us as opposed to a squirrel that just dies. Like he doesn't have that kind of a um, like reflection about death um, that we, we have. Um, and for, for Hegel, not so much about reflection and mortality, but just like the whole ability to reflect is something that kind of um, puts us on a different, completely different league. Um, and that thing that puts us on a different league is human nature. Right. Um, so that's very important to me because now suddenly the animal side didn't vanish, didn't disappear. But what matters now as human nature is not that part. That is still existent. We didn't, you know, uh, eradicate desire. Like it is, that, that's not what happened. But now forget about that. Forget about desire in the way that animals um, uh, deal with it. We are still dealing with de desire, but because we are self-conscious uh, creatures, our dealing with that is also in a completely new category, new, completely new domain. Um, yeah, that's what I have. Trent, and yeah, on that. yeah. Well, while I was reading this, I was like uh, smiling to myself to an extent because, like, that very clear distinction between transformative and additive concept of the introduction of new concept into history or into the overall assessment about, say, human condition is a uh, very medieval and uh, you see that in, in medieval christian chronicles or like in chinese or japanese buddhist chronicles is the spread of christianity or buddhism into their home country was not just a one event it was the transformative event it's just for hegel that was one human beings that that subjectivity started to be conscious of ego they are no longer just and animals and that extra layer fundamentally changed the way you conceptualize or evaluate um, the historical achievement of a nation or a, a place that are given this the, the, the timeline and um, I think that is really interesting um, and it has a profound influence on the way Hegel organizes the material for his 
history of, of philosophy world history why certain places that are just the, put it in the appendix not even in the introduction proper like africa proper or like america so worse certain other places that received a lot of like um space for his analysis i think that really parallels neatly with the medieval christian or um east asian buddhist history writing that there is a clear distinction between additive and a transformative introduction of new concept of course just as you said like those the chroniclers that would also recognize that the human society still needs to produce the food and like um, punish those who kill who try to kill like their neighbors just because of their like rage those problems do exist but th those things must be secondary or um, examined in a completely different light given the introduction of the, the right religion into their place so yes that's it yes um th th that's a that's a very important point and i think uh, this theme also is going to exist in our further work and also the critical um, analysis here that like there are parts in Hegel that continuity is emphasized, right? And everything being on the same plane is emphasized, right? Where progress could be defined uh, because of that. And sometimes, and there, in those cases, uh, changes are additive, right? Things change, but they don't really change, right? They they are really um, in co a continuity. And that's going to be very present in his understanding of um, some aspect of um, the uh, world history in terms of like how, of course, there is transformation in a different layer, but in terms of the standard, they're, they're not changing the standard. They, they, they are just like additions to, to the same story, to the same old story, they're additions. And some are the successful versions and some, some of them are unsuccessful. And sometimes he's dead against continuity and it's all about the leap. And animal to human being is, um, is gonna be one, uh, one way, one, uh, one way that, that it happened. And I think one of the things that we are going to talk and work on later on is that where Hegel thinks things are additive, we can think they are transformative. And when Hegel thinks things are transformative, we can see how they are additive. And there is a criticism that could go both ways for different parts of his understanding uh, of human nature that will fundamentally change uh, the way we understand the relationship between history and philosophy and therefore um, um, the, the concept of human nature as well. So what I suggest is that we end this episode right here so that we kind of introduce the, the engine behind Hegel's argument. Um, and we're gonna come back, we'll talk about more in more details about how Hegel understands the relationship between history and philosophy. And then we get into uh, the details about his historical analysis and how he thinks uh, universal history functions and in what sense we can say that universal history that includes all humanity um has a goal yes a good that's a good idea so see you all next time stay tuned hegel's reason and history episode two is coming up